everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. So let me go ahead and um, just pull up my information. <clears throat> so thank you so much to Chapman and Cutler for sponsoring this session, how to work, how to effectively work with UDOT and UTA. I would also like to thank Gabriel from ITE, who's our tech guru this session. Your presenters today have worked really hard at putting together valuable information to share with you. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about each one of the extremely knowledgeable presenters that you get the opportunity to listen to today. So we'll start with Laura Hansen. Laura Hansen has 20 years of professional planning experience in the public and private sector, focusing on a range of issues from land use to urban design, public policy, environmental and transportation. She joined the Utah Transit Authority in 2017 as the Director of Planning. There, she oversees the agency's long-term strategic planning and service planning divisions. Currently, she's serving on the COVID-19 re Recovery Task Force for the agency where, with the goals of emerging from the crisis with higher ridership than before, greater financial stability for the agency and improved customer confidence. Laura has served on many nonprofit boards, including Envision Utah, Green Bike, and the Utah chapter of the American Planning Association. Next, we have Andrea Olson. Andrea Olson has been working in the land use and transportation planning in Utah for over two decades, having worked in both the private and pr public sectors, including the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, the Wasatch Front Regional Council, Interplan, and Parametrics. Prior to becoming UDOT's planning director in April of 2019, she was the Region 1 planning manager working with local and regional agencies to identify and plan for multimodal transportation solutions that fit within the context of each community and help maintain the safety and viability of the overall transportation network. Andrea holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Next, we have Kevin Leo. Kevin is a TOD project specialist with the Utah Transit Authority. He works closely with committees to plan transit-oriented development near UTA stations. Kevin's current work involves guiding cities to implement transit-supportive development policies, facilitating communication between project managers and stakeholders, and ensuring transit operations and construction efforts function smoothly together. Kevin holds a master's degree in city and metropolitan planning from the University of Utah and a bachelor's degree in geography from Brigham Young University. Last but not least, we have Jeff Sanders, and Jeff is the UDOT planning manager in the Southern Utah area. Jeff's primary responsibilities include leading and supporting transportation planning activities throughout the region. This includes partnering with communities to find ways to make them more connected, safe, and multimodal. Prior to working with UDOT, Jeff worked as a transit planner in Colorado and a land use planner in two Utah cities. Laura, Andrea, Kevin, and Jeff, thank you all so much for joining us today. As a side note to attendees, please leave your questions in the chat box. And as, after all four of the presenters have finished their presentations, we'll get to those and answer as many as we possibly can. Before we get started, we're going to have Gabriel throw up a quick poll just to find out who is on this workshop. So Gabriel, if you could throw that up, that would be great. So if you could all just select the option that fits you best. Looks like we have quite a few people on this call, so it's, uh, we're happy to have you. We've got uh, Trustee Holbrook, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got um, Elizabeth Felix, thank you for coming. Justin Smart with Penna Powers, thanks for being here, Justin. Um, and the list goes on. So we've got a lot of great people on the call today. So thank you all so much for being here. So now I'm going to turn the time over to Laura. Thanks, Laura, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're happy to be here, have a chance to visit with you all about how to effectively work with our transportation agencies. Um, and I hope that you'll get uh, a broad overview of who to work with and how to engage with us, um, as well as some specific details. Um, and I see the poll results here, mostly city staff, people who just love to attend conferences. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, um, so the first thing I wanted to say was when, when should you reach out to UTA? And I think anytime you have a question, are you updating your general plan, reviewing a development proposal, do you have a maintenance issue, a bus stop location is causing an issue, um, you wanna upgrade bus stop amenities along a key corridor, um, 
you're wondering about corridor preservation. Is there TOD potential? Do you just want more transit service? Um, or maybe you haven't really ridden transit before and you just need some help planning a trip. We encourage you to call us anytime a question comes up that you think, hey, you know, I wonder if UTA could have uh, help with this or have some, some um, in information to support us on this. I'm gonna see if I can get in my present mode. There we go, that's better, isn't it? Um, so I know that uh, governmental agencies are sort of notoriously challenging to find a phone list of who to call. So I've given you all a cheat sheet here. You can pull out your cell phones, take a photo. These are cell phone numbers for every um, uh, key, key folks within the agency that I think you might want to hold on to at some point in the future. So snap a quick photo of that. Um, you can reach out to any of these people at any time. Uh, to get more information. And of course, as a, the presenter here today, if you're not sure who to call on this whole list, give me a buzz and I'll make sure that your question gets to the right person. Um, if you're looking for data, you know, where can I find ridership data? Where can I find um, the information about the performance of a particular bus route or how many people are getting on at this bus stop in my community? We have an open data portal on our website. Uh, it's rideuta.com forward slash data. Um, you can find all kinds of information on here. Um, it hasn't been analyzed. It's just the raw information. So you can download a spreadsheet and crunch the numbers however you like, but that's a helpful resource to you as well. Um, I wanted to talk through a little bit of our various different planning processes and how local governments and planners can engage in this process. And the first step really in identifying any sort of major corridor or project within um, the region, the first step is really engaging in the regional transportation planning process. And this is a process that's led by the local metropolitan planning organizations. And in UTA's service area, that would be Wasatch Front Regional Council and the Mountain Land Association of Governments. Um, both of those uh, organizations go through a similar process to develop visions and plans, and they'll develop a document at the end of that called the Regional Transportation Plan that looks 30 years into the future and says by decade, uh, which highway and, and transit projects um, and active transportation um, does our region need and, and how we might pay for those. So it's important to note that this is really a, a process led by the MPOs, it's adopted by the MPOs, and all of the local governments that serve on those uh, policy committees. Um, but at the end of that planning process, anything that's transit related goes one of two paths. The first is to the capital development process, if it is a future light rail line or a BRT line, um, something that's kind of a major capital project. If it is local transit service, it goes through our service planning process. Um, and there's opportunities for community and local government engagement all throughout that process. And so I'll walk through um, kind of the capital and service planning processes next. Um, we have this handy flowchart. Again, I hope you have your cell phones out and you're taking screenshots and, and snapshots of these. If you're ever curious, okay, so I've got a project in the RTP. How does it get to on the ground? Um, and this is the process through which that happens. First in the planning phase, uh, we identify the purpose and need, ridership benefits, funding potential, kind of ballpark cost estimates, and we put together our proposed capital project. Um, an example of something that's in this phase right now, we are just kicking off a transit study in South Utah County, looking at uh, a potential connection from Provo all the way down to Santa Quinn um, by public transit. And that could be, uh, in the RTP, it's identified as a commuter rail line extension, um, but we're thinking there may be some interim steps uh, that we could accomplish a little bit sooner. So that's a project in that phase. Um, then you move into the environmental process where you develop an alternatives analysis, do conceptual engineering. Um, and this is a point where our local advisory council at UTA would adopt the capital project and say, yes, this is something we think we should do. And then it can move forward through the rest of the process. An example of something that's in this phase right now is a point of the mountain um, alternatives analysis or the Davis Salt Lake City connector BRT project are both in that phase. Then it moves into funding and procurement. Um, our Ogden 
uh, WSUBRT line is something that's falling in this area where we basically have a project designed and ready to go. We're just working on compiling all the funding for it. Once the funding's secure, then it moves into design, construction, and operations. And um, I hope many of you have had an opportunity to ride the new UVX BRT line in um, South, in Utah County, Provo, and Orem area. That's one of our, our most recent completed capital projects. So if it's not a capital project and it's more local bus service, uh, we go through a similar, a similar looking process where we start with the uh, regional transportation plan and then we go into something called our five-year mobility plan. Um, we are mirroring the same steps in this, which include a lot of public outreach, um, and it's something that would be uh, adopted by our local advisory council and board. The idea behind the five-year plan is that it's kind of a, a roadmap. It says where we want to be within five years with our local planning service. It's not a prescriptive list of service changes, and so you won't, uh, nothing in this plan is cut in stone, uh, but it's an idea of where we think we're headed based on the information that we have at today. Once we have that plan and we're ready to actually start implementing changes, then we go through our operations planning process. And this starts with outreach to affected local governments. We'll say, hey, this is a change that's proposed in your community. We just want to explain to you um, some of the reasons why we're making this change. Um, it goes through a public hearing. It goes through a Title VI analysis, which is a, a Civil Rights Act um, step where we analyze whether we're having a disproportionate impact on minority or low income populations. And our board will approve that and then something moves forward through uh, to implementation during one of our annual change days. So the types of things, a lot of people I think feel like the local bus planning process is a little bit mysterious. Sometimes the city will come to us and they'll say, hey, you know, we'd really like service on this corridor and UTA will go back to our office and we'll type away and do some modeling and then we'll come back and we'll say, I'm sorry, that's not gonna work. And our local governments will say, well, why doesn't it work? And so we're trying to demystify that process a little bit with this more transparent planning process. Um, and identify some of the things that go into those decisions. And I've listed a number of them here. How productive the route is, densities, uh, where, what are the demographics and socioeconomics of the populations we're serving. Uh, and then there's a lot of really detailed operational things like travel time and origin destination data. Um, can our bus make a left turn in this particular area without a, a traffic light? How many buses do we have available? Um, do we have enough operators to provide the service at the time? Um, but all, a lot, all of that is also influenced by customer comments, public input, and requests that we get from our local governments. And so we try to be really diligent. It's a very robust pro process, and I have some documents, um, if anyone wants more detail, that kind of walk through the, the nuts and bolts of all of that. One thing that I wanted to leave with you as a, a key takeaway is that if you want a high rent ridership and successful transit uh, route, there are a couple different connect, uh, key elements to that. One is the transit service quality. That's, does it leave and go where you want and when you want it to go? Is the bus clean? Uh, how is the fare? Is the operator courteous? Um, does it travel during hours when it's useful? Those are all things that UTA can control. Uh, a couple other critical elements are supportive land use and a connected street network. If you have the right mix of land uses to support uh, a density that will ride popu uh, public transit, that's incredibly helpful. And uh, the ability to get to and from the transit station. And two, you know, those two items really fall squarely within the realm of local governments. And so successful public transit really requires a partnership between us and you all. Uh, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, one of the things we're looking for is how many people are near transit. Uh, the more density we have, the more ridership we're going to have on a bus. Uh, the lower the density, the lower the ridership. Are there long distances between destinations? If you have a great node of lots of density and then there's a long stretch of time between this and then you hit another one, that results in relatively low ridership and really expensive bus service because we have to travel all that distance to pick up those people. So to the extent that local governments can concentrate uh, high density and high um, rider transit ridership destinations together in a corridor, that makes for much more successful transit. 
Another is how easily people can get to the transit stops. Uh, obviously, a grid um, gets people to and from. It gives you far more options to get to the bus stop, which is the gray circle in the very in the kind of the bullseye in the middle of these diagrams. If you have a less connected street network, people oftentimes have to walk a lot further distance to reach the bus stop, and therefore it's not as effective, and so you get lower ridership. And the last one is, can transit run in straight lines? Uh, if you have all these great destinations in your community, but there's a school up here and a library down here and a high density uh, housing development here and offices over here and the bus has to zigzag kind of back and forth to reach all of those. That makes for a much longer transit trip, uh, a much more expensive trip for UTA to deliver. And if you're um, a rider and you're trying to just get through this area from one end to the other, it means your trip is a lot longer. And the longer that is, the more likely people are going to say, oh, forget it, I'm just going to drive my car. And so as you're planning your cities, to, you, if you can put things sort of on the way, uh, that makes it much more successful um, for, uh, for public transit. Another thing that we get questions about a lot is about our bus stops. Uh, a lot of communities don't have a rail system um, that touches their community. And so the bus stops are really your front door to the public transit system. Uh, we try to, you know, some of them are in great shape. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of them that really need some, some TLC. Uh, UTA has been operating since um, the 70s. And there's a lot of transit uh, bus stops that have been out there probably since the, the, you know, their, initial, their initial development and they haven't really been updated. We are slowly trying to work through that at UTA. Just like any um, agency, our budgets are limited and so there's only so much that we can do each year. And so we wanted to be really thoughtful about how we were prioritizing these inputs or these improvements. And so we put together a scoring matrix. It's very objective. And we look at the uh, seven factors that are listed here on the screen. Um, how many wheelchair ramp deployments are there? How many buses are transferring at this place? Uh, you know, is, it a, is there a safety issue? Have we had somebody um, injure themselves at this bus stop? Uh, is it ADA compliant? Um, and so we look at all of these things and it spits out a score and ranks and prioritizes each of the bus stops in our system and tells us which ones that we need to invest um, in the soonest. And then there's questions often about, well, how do you know what kinds of amenities end up at each of the bus stops? And so we have a series of seven different uh, levels of bus stop amenities. They're based on headways um, of the bus service and also the number of people that get on and off at each bus stop. Um, level one is simply a, a sign on a pole and an ADA uh, concrete pad. That is our basic bus stop. And then it goes all the way up to um, two custom benches, a shelter, digital signage, lighting, um, trash cans. Um, and we, we kind of go through uh, a ranking of, of how many people are using the stop to determine what level of investment we should make at each one. Here's some examples of uh, the kind of higher levels of, of transit service. And also a pie chart that shows you that the vast majority of our bus stops really are going to fall into level one or two. Um, those are, are simple, uh, you know, a basic shelter, a sign, a trash can, and a concrete pad. Um, but we have a handful that, that warrant higher level investments. And then my last slide here, so I leave time for my other co-presenters here, is uh, if you have any question at all, just give us a buzz. Uh, I, you've got hopefully uh, that mailing list or the palm tree list at the, at the beginning of the presentation that you can refer back to. But if you're just not sure who to call, you can also call our basic information line. I get requests about all kinds of things. There's graffiti in a tunnel. We'd like to install a memorial to a fallen officer at a, tra at a bus stop station. Um, you know, any kind of question whatsoever, give us a buzz. We're here to be a partner with you. Um, we want to help you accomplish your goals um, and we'll make sure that we um, are able to at least explore any idea or option that you want to throw out there. It may not always be a yes, but we're happy to take a look at it. So with that, I'm going to end my screen sharing and pass it on to Andrea. Thank you, Laura. Let's see, I'm going to hopefully get this going.
takes a second. All right. Um, so it's always nice to, to present with um, UTA. We do a lot of work with UTA. And if nothing else, it's kind of a good chance to distinguish ourselves because believe it or not, a lot of people think that we're the same agency and, and we definitely are not, but we do work together and, um, and you know, enjoy kind of the give and take and the camaraderie. So thanks for that, Laura. So I just want to talk to you about some of the, the processes and programs that UDOT planning has in place where I think really local government um, input and collaboration are, are extremely important to us and, and really help make these processes work. So this is a list of the, the programs that I'm going to walk through um, and I will give you more detail about each of these. And then later on in the session today, Jeff Sanders, who works for UDOT Planning, but in one of our regions is gonna talk more specifically about um, working with local governments and I think give you some great examples of, of how that's gone for uh, him in the region. Uh, so the first one is the technical planning assistance. This was a recommendation by Governor Herbert in 2019 and, and adopted and funded by the legislature in 2019. And it's really modeled after Wasatch Front Regional Council's Transportation and Land Use Connection Grant Program, if you're familiar with that. Um, the intent is really for providing resources to help local governments explore that land use and transportation connection um, and, and what the interplay of those two things. You can see the, the program goals there of integrating land use and transportation, um, obviously for the state DOT, maximizing the value of public investment is a big priority for us really looking at options to increase mobility, whether that's transit, whether that's active transportation, looking at all modes. And then just, I think, generally creating communities that people want to live in and work in and play in. Um, there is a local government match requirement on this. It's 6.77%, uh, which I think matches what Wasatch Front's match requirement is and is also the federal, kind of the, the federal threshold. Um, for fiscal year 2020 funding, and that was the original year funded by the legislature, we received about 70, or we received 72 applications for about $4.8 million in requests. And we had a million dollars in that first year. So obviously this has been popular. There's a lot of um, need and excitement about this program. Unfortunately, we just haven't been able to fund all of the requests that we get. For FY21 funding, we are in the process of evaluating those applications right now. They, we, we only received 41 for a total of about $2.3 million in requests. And I think that's largely due to um, cities just not being sure with tax revenues down due to the pandemic. You know, cities haven't been sure about um, what money is going to be coming in. So I think have been a little bit hesitant to apply for this. We're, you know, we're hoping to see that go back up. Um, for FY22, we are actually going to align our application process with WFRC's TLC process. One of the things that we heard was that there was some confusion on the local government side. You know, can I apply for this? Um, you know, the, the technical planning assistance is intended to cover statewide and so um, especially communities that might be within the, TL, the WFRC area. We just wanted to minimize confusion and so it will be one application and then we internal we internally will divide them up between the wfrc area and the rest of the state and and consider them that way another really great program that we have within udot planning is called the move utah program um, this is intended to help communities Further their active transportation efforts are further their active transportation efforts. And I think one of the really exciting things about this is the flexibility that, you know, every community is kind of at a different spot related to active transportation. And so this um, offers communities, you know, we can help them kind of wherever they are. If they are looking for funds to actually do an active transportation plan, we can help with that effort. 
Um, we have hosted law enforcement forums. Sometimes the issue has been, you know, understanding what the rules are related to active transportation and so helping everybody kind of understand what they can and can't do. Um, and also economic development has been a big one. There are a lot of, especially rural cities that have looked to um, mountain biking and cycling as tourism generators. And so, you know, what kinds of economic development efforts could they, um, could they put in to attracting that kind of, um, attracting that tourism. And I think we've been helpful in just getting those conversations going. Uh, the final thing is I think transportation and health are really becoming part of the same conversation. And this is where we have the most direct connection with the health department, the, the Utah Department of Health, as well as Get Healthy Utah, have both been involved in the Move Utah effort. And so that's, I think, another resource that we bring to local governments through the Move Utah program. Solutions development is, um, it's, a, it's a new process, I think. It's got a new name, um, but to me, this is really just good planning. The intent here is to really uh, identify future areas of need and then give us the time to look at them in more detail. Look at these corridors or these small areas look at them in more detail so that when it comes time to um, fund a project or construct a project, that we have a far better, more robust understanding of what the specific needs are and what, uh, what this particular project is accomplishing. Um, so the first step in the solutions development process is to sit down with the local governments and any stakeholders in the area so and really get a real a very fine detailed understanding of what the goals and objectives of the community are what the the vision an area has for itself and and how we as a transportation agency can help with infrastructure that that meets those goals and objectives or supports that vision um this is where we can really look at uh, you know, land use, what the land use priorities. I think one of the slides that Laura showed was, you know, if, if transit is important in a corridor, what kind of land, land use densities do you need to support that? You know, that's where the, this discussion would happen. Um, what are the economic development goals of the area? And are there, you know, are there transportation infrastructure that can support that? Um, is freight a priority in this area and what do we need to do to support that? So it's really just helping you to understand how we can support what the, what the, the vision is for the local government or for the, the small area. And the transportation, this is always a mouthful, the, it's TIF and TTIF, the Transportation Investment Fund and then the Transit Transportation Investment Fund. So TIF has been around for a long time. This is our UDOT's major funding source for capacity projects. So if we're adding a lane on I-15, this is the fund that we use for that. Um, and that's been around for a long time. But in 2018, the legislature really opened up some opportunities with this. So we are now able to fund active transportation projects out of TIF, and then they added the TTIF, they added the transit piece of it. So out of TTIF, we can now fund transit projects and then also first mile, last mile projects, which are bike ped connections uh, specific to um, connecting to transit service. So as, it, as the process stands right now, it is a nomination process for those three areas, not for highway, but for active transportation, transit, and first last mile, it's, it's fully a nomination process. So a local government or a transit district can nominate a process to be prioritized and ranked and then presented to the commission, the Utah Transportation Commission for potential funding. There's a lot of detail about that nomination process on the UDOT website. <clears throat> it's ex we're expecting it to open, the nomination process to open in October and probably run into January. Um, and it's, it's a form, it's a Google form to fill out and submit. But a couple of things to know are 
in nominating a project, there is a 40% match requirement. And the only stipulation on that is that it is non-state funding. Um, and we try to be fairly expansive about what could be included in the match. It could be right of way, it could be uh, in kind work, it could be previous studies that have been done. Um, but you know, 40% can be a heavy lift, especially on some of these larger capital projects. So just know that that's there. And then also the ability to demonstrate the ability to operate and maintain. So for a transit, um, for transit service, it would be having the funds in place that you can maintain that transit service. The long range transportation plan is kind of the bread and butter of UDOT planning. This is, this is what we've been doing for a long time. Um, we, we plan for the rural parts of the state, the, the four MPOs in the state plan for the urbanized areas. Um, and then we put all of those plans together in the what's called the Utah's Unified Transportation Plan. So we do these on the same cycle. We do them every four years. We're just getting going on, the, on another cycle of them now. They look out over a 30 year period and we maintain financial constraints. So as those entities together, we decide, you know, what are, what are reasonable forecasts for transportation funding and then um, make plans accordingly and, and, and don't exceed those forecasts so that we're not, you know, just planning wildly into the future, but um, maintaining a constrained list of projects. And then we really want to include all types of projects, active transportation, um, freight, we have safety projects, and then obviously highway as well. And this is really an opportunity as we get going on this next cycle, I think this is a great opportunity to work with local governments to understand, you know, what are their concerns um, out over the next few decades and, and what kinds of projects can we be looking at in the long range plan that would address those concerns. And finally, um, UDOT added a region planner in each of our four regions in 2018. And I think the value of these positions really can't be overstated. I think I actually started out as a, the region one planner. And when I started there, I got so many questions from local governments or so many comments that I never know who to contact at UDOT, you know, can you help me? And so like Laura said, I would take a picture of this if, and if you haven't met your region planner yet, I would. They're a great resource to UDOT of just helping you find the right person, um, you know, if you have a question or a problem. Um, and like I said, Jeff Sanders, who's the region four, he obviously has a lot of geography to cover. Uh, he's going to be talking in a few minutes just about specific experiences in his area um, and some of the some of the workings with local governments that he's been doing. So that is all I have and I will stop sharing and turn it over to Kevin. Great, thanks, Andrea. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just kind of talk about UTA's transit-oriented development program a little bit. Uh, kind of discuss our framework and also look through uh, if we have some time, uh, some examples of current projects that we're um, that we're working on. Um, a lot of the elements of uh, transit oriented development, uh, so this, this definition, mixed, compact, accessible, and near high quality transit. Um, a lot of the elements are probably similar to what Laura touched on, on uh, what makes a good transit route, uh, would also help make a good transit oriented development. Um, so kind of a lot of uh, mix of uses, uh, kind of um, higher density uh, around stations are important. Uh, walkability is extremely important for people to get to and from the station and then uh, to the surrounding um, the surrounding area. Um, and again, <laughs> this is like a, a, walk, a walk score showing uh, different uh, amenities near a station on the top. Um, it's a very accessible station, our Ogden Frontrunner Station, whereas on the bottom shows our, uh, our Draper Frontrunner Station. Uh, both make a huge difference in terms of um, activation and 
um, access to um, and success of the TOD. Um, connected streets, um, obviously streets that are, um, the more connections you have, uh, the more uh, different destinations and origins you're able to access. Whereas uh, when there's a less connected street network, uh, you know, it's, it's a little more a little more limited on what you're able to access. Um, and then another important element could be uh, a mix of housing. So from, you know, small single family homes to townhomes to apartments, um, I think this would really help uh, with vibrancy for transit oriented developments. Um, being able to provide uh, opportunities for people of, um, you know, different uh, economic backgrounds, different um, mobility or um, other other needs, uh, just have that diversity uh, and provide meeting spaces. <laughs> Obviously, this picture was taken pre-COVID, um, but, uh, you know, social distancing now, but with masks and stuff, uh, but being able to have places where people can gather and um, celebrate events. Um, so some benefits of TOD, uh, we feel like it can address uh, growth challenges that uh, are facing the region. It can uh, enhance economic development, uh, help the environment uh, to uh, have people take transit and maybe drive uh, single occupancy vehicles less, uh, help people get around more uh, and improve their health uh, by walking or biking, um, provide more affordable options um, near transit, uh, especially uh, you know people who might be able to uh, get rid of the car entirely and uh, just have that, that lifestyle to be on transit, they're able to save huge amounts of money that way. And, and then also provide uh, a sense of place for communities. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the nation. Uh, but however, we're really um, concentrated in how we're developed. Uh, we have lakes, we have mountains, and so there's only uh, really certain places where uh, future growth can happen and where existing growth has happened. Um, and this has led to a lot of undesirable consequences uh, such as traffic congestion or uh, bad air quality. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, um, we've had a great quality of life here, but I think, uh, you know, continued growth uh, has reduced some of this, um, some of this access. Um, the Wasatch Toy Story 2050 plan, uh, it's a really great regional process that uh, many communities have participated in. And uh, one of the, the major outcomes from, from this recent plan uh, was the idea of concentrating growth around um, major nodes where, where transit is also one of those major nodes. Um, and this would help to mitigate some of those uh, negative impacts. Um, at UTA, we wanna support this vision. Um, we want to create origins and destinations that, uh, that promote transit ridership. We want to encourage economic development and um, we wanna make sure that we capture value from um, the public investments around uh, where our stations are. Um, the enabling legislation that allowed us to do this was in 2010. Uh, and this is also supported by uh, the Federal Transit Administration, allowing transit agencies to implement TOD on federally funded properties. Um, just this last year uh, in 2020, uh, SB 150, uh, it took away the, the cap on um, Oops. on uh, the amount of developments we could do. Previously, we could do uh, eight, uh, but now we're able to do more. And um, in the past, has kind of made us focus on kind of the best, the best bang for the buck, uh, if it were, because we had that hard limit on how many total developments we could do. Uh, but now we're able to uh, increase our partnerships with um, many cities and, and look for ways to um, catalyze development and, uh, and, and just look at, um, kind of smaller, um, more impactful, or, you know, those smaller projects. Um, this this uh, legislation um, helped to uh, codify the importance of transit-oriented development, um, helped to uh, create that expectation that UTA will continue to work with MPOs and cities and counties to create these joint visioning station area plans, um, and also um, just make sure that uh, that the moderate income housing requirements uh, and also uh, kind of those um, UTA being a partner in that, I uh, just make sure that uh, those, those things are being met. Um, because of this, UTA 
uh, we're better able to take advantage of uh, different environments uh, while we still have a, uh, a way of ranking stations for development priority. Uh, you know, if cities are interested in working with us and have great ideas for uh, new developments, we encourage them to reach out and, uh, and create these uh, station plans and also work to create future developments um, that would be able to, uh, you know, better take it better economic or let's see how I say this, uh, just make sure that economic development happens. Um, we really want to make sure that um, we include a broad list of stakeholders in creating these these visioning plans. We feel like uh, they'll help create a, a great future. Obviously, UTA wants, uh, you know, high ridership and great transit experience, um, while communities might be more focused on, uh, you know, creating great places and uh, preserving uh, neighborhoods around. So striking that balance, uh, but also creating opportunities for the future is, is very important to us. Um, and, and like I mentioned, uh, Utah's population will probably double over the next 40 or so years. Uh, and so we really want to work together with communities uh, to create joint vision plans uh, and create the best places possible. Uh, this is a little bit about our, our framework. Um, we've really focused hard on, on this planning element, uh, but we want to uh, link UTA decisions to regional objectives, capture that local vision, uh, incorporate any kind of local plans or existing plans that exist, and then create uh, objective prior to criteria to select both the TOD sites, but also the development partners who might work on them. Um, and in this planning stage, uh, again, we, we look to uh, work and create those visions. Uh, our our qual uh, quantitative method, uh, a model right now, uh, takes in land availability, uh, connectivity, market strength, and public support as the main, uh, the main variables that go into it. Uh, we want to make a really clear uh, request for proposal process to uh, select development partners that are able to carry out the vision that was identified um, you know, from the community and UTA. Uh, we create a master plan, a general idea of what th when things will happen and what will happen. Uh, this gets into site design, which looks at uh, more specific uh, phases and planning on, um, on specific buildings. We make sure that uh, the development uh, pencils and that, uh, you know, that all partners are able to get, um, you know, proper uh, financial uh, benefit from this thing. And then uh, we, we also do property management uh, to make sure that things are being developed correctly. And then also uh, make sure that the developments are, are, are what they are expected to be. Um, and here are just some of the projects we've, um, that are in construction currently. A lot of these are mostly completed or already completed. Uh, top left is uh, 9000 South, our Sandy Civic Center station. Uh, top right is Jordan Valley. Uh, bottom left is our South Jordan Frontrunner Station. And bottom right is our Meadowbrook 3900 South Track Station. So um, Sandy East Village, this is one of our, our first ones that kicked off. Uh, what was cool about Sandy um, is we, uh, we have a mix of residential and office uh, uses kind of in this uh, kind of in this in this master plan um, and uh, this is our, our current phasing um, we've already completed most of our residential development here uh, currently we're working on phase five which is a really great um, like a small small retail space uh, but also more residential and a, a dedicated uh, parking garage for the development uh, previously this whole area had been a large surface parking lot um, i think that was uh, and, and now it's is more a lot more vibrant and able to um, provide a lot of uh, people opportunity to get to, onto our system, but then also um, jobs and um, economic development here. Um, the first phase, uh, these apartments, uh, 269 units. And uh, there's also interesting to note that while um, the bottom units are residential, they are built in a way that uh, they can be converted to um, retail uh, facing that, that main street uh, when, uh, when the market's right. And so there's a lot of flexibility in that, which is great. Um, we have some office, utility department of human services, 
um, completing that uh, that for that another phase of off or of um, housing. Uh, we have a bridge capital um, office building here, um, really close to the station. Um, and then this is what we're currently working on, kind of a, a small retail pad right next to the transit station, while also providing um, more housing units and parking garage. And then hopefully we can, um, we can get the second office uh, on State Street um, with another um, that, that really, really, really great uh, amount of jobs. This is our Jordan Valley station, uh, and this is a mostly residential development. Uh, but there are some opportunities for retail and perhaps maybe future office if uh, if the the retail landscape or the office landscape changes. Um, 270 units. Uh, they're currently working on a phase two um, kind of apartments and townhomes uh, on this uh, eastern edge and center area. And um, yeah, uh, this is our our Jordan Valley station. Or sorry, South. South Jordan Station, we have a lot of Jordans in our names. Um, and this is mostly completed. We have um, two twin office buildings that uh, total 360,000 square feet, uh, 5,000 square feet of retail in a 192 room hotel. And um, yeah, we have these offices are already leased and uh, they're mainly tech tenants uh, and that they're really enjoying the proximity to transit that these provide. And finally, this is our uh, Meadowbrook uh, 3900 South Track Station. This is a really great development. Um, this was just uh, completed last month, uh, or we had the ground baking last month. Uh, it has 156 units, uh, 110 of which are affordable, and uh, 16 of which are uh, specifically um, allocated for people who are working or who are part of this uh, next work autism center. Uh, so people who uh, and this and this center is kind of a, a job training, uh, a resource center, it allows people to be able to um, to uh, gain skills they need for uh, the future uh, job work. Uh, but they're also, it's also great because, uh, you know, they're able to get the skills where they would no, otherwise not be able to. Uh, and a lot of these units are also um, ADA accessible uh, and designed in such a way with when that comes, that's that's kind of the first thing in mind. Um, so yeah, um, that's my presentation and I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Let's see. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Jeff Sanders, I'm a planner with the Utah Department of Transportation. Um, it's a shame that we're not meeting in person. You know, these conferences are um, always one of my, my favorite events of the year. Um, I think they're doing a great job, but there's also just that, that missing personal element. Um, all right, so get to my presentation here. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a, I'm a planner that's based in um, the southern Utah region. Um, we, you've seen this this uh, graphic before. Um, I, I work in Region 4. I, I live in St. George. And as you can see, Region 4 is quite large. Um, any guess out there uh, on how many communities are in Region 4? You know, there's 14 counties. Um, if you figure maybe, you know, five or six e each county. It's actually even more than that. There are close to 100 different um, communities in Region 4. And I say that just to help you understand that if you're waiting for, for UDOT to approach you and talk about some of your transportation issues, it, it just might never happen. You know, there's, there are a number of different competing interests out there. So today, um, I just want to give you a few uh, tips on how to better approach and work with, um, with UDOT from a region perspective. Uh, most of the, if you've communicated with, with UDOT staff before, uh, most likely it has been with the region. These are the folks that are living and, and working in the region. You know, they're, they're the, the um, plowing snow in the winter, uh, fixing roads in the summers. 
Um, before I, I jump into that, I just want to mention this quality of life framework that, that UDOT follows. Um, this is something the organization created recently in response to some legislation. Um, this, this shows that there are major factors in deciding in how highways affect communities. Um, good health, better mo mobility, strong economy, connected communities. I think in the past, UDOT has given a lot of emphasis on looking at mobility and choosing highway projects and managing highways to, to maximize mobility. But we're recognizing it increasingly in the organization that good health is also an important part. Strong economy um, and connected communities are also important. And <clears throat> this is more than just uh, theoretical. You know, this is, UDOT has worked to quantify these different factors and are using a, a formula or a methodology for evaluating and scoring projects. And so it's actually, you know, in use currently. To, this year was the first year that we've been doing this. Um, we're, we're working on improving the process now. But I think we're, we're putting, you know, our, our money where our mouth is in terms of, of um, looking at a, an expanded understanding of how highways affect communities. Um, I'm going to go, go out on a limb here and um, invite anyone who might be listening to, to use the chat and um, provide any perceptions that they have um, of working with UDOT. You know, that might, might be based on, on recent experience or, or simply um, reputation. Um, but I'd invite, you know, people to, to um, provide any comments on working with UDOT. And feel free to be honest. Um, you know, I've, I've probably seen all of the comments out there. Um, and then, Katie, I can't, I can't see the chat, so let me know if any, any come in. But I, I've got a few that I wanted to mention. One is, um, I think, a perception, that a, view, a perception that UDOT is a regulatory agency as opposed to a partnering agency. And this comes from my experience. I, I worked as a planner in Utah for a few years. And, and you know, we viewed UDOT really as a, as a checkbox. Um, but I think we've, we've got some tools, and, and Laura spoke previously, or excuse me, Andrea spoke previously about um, some tools for how we can better work more closely with communities. Um, some of the, let's see, some of the things that I'm seeing here, um, a prior reputation and experience was inflexible. That is changing for the better. Um, that's funny. That's exactly one of the one of the comments I have here. Down below, we did we did a survey of some communities, and um, by and large, we actually got some some positive feedback. But we saw that there were about a third of communities that said that UDOT was um, an obstacle to to um, to. Uh, or presented some some obstacles in working together to make decisions about highways. Um, so Jeff, I'll just, just one other. Little, oh, can you see sure. the one that says one perception is that UDOT is more interested in improving current facilities than expanding service to new and outlying communities. Okay. All right. I think I think that's a fair point. Um, so why is it important to build relationships with UDOT? Um, really fundamentally, I think it, it comes down to having an influence, the community having an influence in how the highway functions. Um, someone is making decisions about that highway through your community. And it might as well, you, you might as well as a community um, have some say in that and work closely with UDOT in doing that. You know, it might be related to safety and maintenance concerns, but it also might be with active transportation concerns. Um, just this morning, I, I got a call from a, a person in, in Orderville, Utah, that talked about students walking a half mile up to um, a, a community center and having to, to walk along US 89, which is a, a busy highway. You know, and he, he's asking, what can we do with this? How can, how can we get some sort of um, off-road trail that, that these students can use. Um, also, uh, if you have a close relationship with UDOT, I think you'll be able to be aware of funding and grant opportunities. 
So I've got three tips I want to talk about, about how to build collaborative long-term relationships with UDOT. The first one of these is maximize opportunities to communicate. Um, this is a challenge because um, for, for one thing, you know, there's a lot of staff turnover, not, not just in UDOT, but also um, in communities. Um, oftentimes UDOT works with local leaders, elected leaders, that might serve a term of you know four years to ten years, and have to have gone through a lot of work and developed good relationships, and that that person is replaced. So there's obviously a lot of challenge here, but I've listed five five um, opportunities here that are sort of standing recurring opportunities for you to interact more with UDOT. The first one is are these annual visits, not particularly a creative name, but this is where UDOT goes out to each of the counties in the state. And we, we contact um, the, the, each of the cities that are in that county and say, we're, you know, we're coming to your county. This is the, the information. And in that meeting, we talk about various things. Um, also, we talk about um, current projects and, and future pending projects. Um, there's a number of region staff that, that participate in those. And so you, you have an opportunity there I think to ask questions about current projects and just start developing relationships. Um, number two is involvement with the MPO. Um, a lot of the transportation planning for urban areas happens in the MPO and UDOT um, tries to do everything we can to stay close with not only the staff at the MPO, but the cities and towns and officials that work through the MPO. In St. George, we have an, an MPO here and UDOT staff attends, usually multiple staff attend every meeting. Um, and so we, we hear about a number of issues and become aware of, of needs uh, doing that. If you're in a rural area, you don't have an MPO, but you do have an AOG. Those AOGs have, have planners. Um, the planners, um, you can talk with them. And, and I, I, I speak with those rural a AOG planners often. Um, so that's a way to, to establish a relationship. Project meetings, even if you have a simple project like repaving a highway, um, UDOT meets with the local officials to talk about what that's going to mean for your highway in terms of traffic, and that's a way to develop relationships. Lastly, this um, UDOT commission meetings. Uh, the commission is our, is our executive board. They meet monthly, and about half of the time they go out to communities around the state. And usually local communities are invited to make a, a presentation at the beginning. And it's a, it's a great way for communities to express their concerns and meet a number of, of UDOT staff that are also in attendance. Um, one example I, I want to give is at, a, is at a commission meeting in the St. George area last year. And a, a town, the mayor from a, a town visited. Um, they had been having trouble with this uh, particular issue and not really making much headway with, with uh, UDOT staff for, for a variety of reasons. But they made a, a, a really impassioned um, plea for assistance and help and, and really caught the attention of the UDOT commissioners. And you know, when you get the attention of a UDOT commissioner, um, you're able to really affect what, what the staff of the organization does. So th these are just ways that you can engage and, and start to open up opportunities to build relationships with UDOT. Um, in addition, just to the, the number of instances you, ha you, you do interact with UDOT, we should work together to communicate more effectively. At one of my first meetings when I started working here, I talked with the city manager after he had had a meeting and he said he was a little bit bewildered because we were talking about a, a safety issue, a traffic signal. And he said, it's like UDOT and the community were, were speaking past each other. We weren't, we were talking about the same thing, but, but, you know, UDOT was speaking in terms of warrants and, and all these sort of technical things and the community just wanted safety. And so um, a lot of times it's hard to, to speak um, frankly and openly in a way that we can each understand each other. And I've got a few tips here about how to make, our communications more effective. You know, one, one here on the community side is it's really helpful for UDOT for the community to have a local vision. Um, UDOT, it helps UDOT understand how it can help. 
if there's a, a major um, project and um, the community is split about the, the project, you know, UDOT oftentimes does not want to get insert itself into that community issue. Um, also on, on the UDOT side, um, this is for UDOT staff. You know, UDOT staff, I think, needs to be more aware of this new quality of life framework that when we talk about highways, we're not talking about just mobility benefits, we're talking about um, connected communities and health, health benefits and economic development benefits. If we're able to speak about um, uh, UDOT projects in those kinds of terms, I think that it, it helps um, make, will make the conversation um, go smoother. Um, I think that means I just have a couple more minutes. So let me rush through these, these last two slides. These are just two examples that I have. Uh, this is a picture of Tory in su Southern Utah. And, excuse me, let me back up and say that the last point I want to make is that communities that financially participate in solutions and work together with UDOT are usually much more successful. Um, Tory had a number of active transportation improvements that they were pursuing. And combined, they were quite expensive. They wanted to expand the shoulders along this highway. You can see it's only a foot or two there. And then they also wanted to put in a trail that was on the other side of those, those big pretty trees that you see. Um, and we, we were able to, to work together. They had prepared an active transportation plan. In the end, um, Tory, who, who as a city does not have a lot of money, they agreed, they, they were able to um, drum up enough money to pay for um, a soft surface trail, a cheaper version of a trail to go along those trees. And UDOT was willing to pay to expand the, the shoulders to accommodate bikers uh, along that highway. I thought, I thought that was a great project. Lastly, just this, um, an example of bringing together several of these things. This is a uh, Tokerville, um, a town about 20 miles west of Zion National Park. Um, Tokerville has a ton of traffic that goes through their little main street on the way to Zion. And they started talking as a community about building a bypass for that, for that through traffic. And they put together a community vision. Um, they had a, a pretty extensive planning process, identified an alignment of where that, by, that bypass road would go. Um, and then they started approaching UDOT. They actually came to a UDOT commission that was in the area a couple of years ago, started talking to commissioners and UDOT staff. And I think generally the, the UDOT opinion was, this is a great project, but ew, this, is, this is really expensive. And we, ha we have another about a number of other communities that also are seeking bypasses. Um, but the, the community really rallied together. They started working with landowners um, and developers in the area where the bypass was, um, was designed to go and was able to put together the, all of the property, all of the road right of way where that was needed for this bypass. And a, a, a developer of a future large development even agreed to pay for the initial phase of the bypass. And at that point, UDOT said, well, this is great. And this is actually works with our plans um, once that initial phase is complete, UDOT can take over that bypass and, and expand on it. So I think that's a great example of communities um, getting their vision, um, working with UDOT staff and, and UDOT commission, and finding um, ways to work together with UDOT to, to fund the solution. Um, that's all I have. I'm going to turn the, back, the, the time back over to Katie. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff.